Up here, right? Yep. Do I need to be? Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Hey, cool. Thanks for waking up. Yeah. Um, pity that you can't be here, but uh, in person. Again, but we understand all that. Um, just to uh, do a little introduction, this is the final lecture in our seven part series entitled Into Completion, um, which has explored the processes involving um, architecture's various realizations. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Kil Mo uh, conclude the series by mixing um, construction ecology, material history, and world system analysis through the lens of architecture, helping us to think through the terrestrial activities that engender building in general, and more specifically, through the example of the most modern of modern architectures, the Seagram building. Um, Kiel is a registered practicing architect, a visiting professor at MIT. He was previously the Cass Gilbert visiting professor at the University of Minnesota, the Gerald Schreff Professor of Architecture at McGill University, and Associate Professor of Architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. He has received numerous awards in recognition of his design and research endeavors, and is the author of nine books on architecture, including Empire, State, and Building, Wood Urbanism from the Molecular to the Territorial, and Insulating Modernism, Isolated and Non-Isolated. Um, thermodynamics in architecture. Um, it's a pleasure to have you conclude the series, Kiel. Um, as you know, I am an avid admirer of your, especially your writings and your overall work. Um, and I very much appreciate how you are able to um, take um, very abstract and theoretical ideas, but push them through the lens of architecture to help us uh, rethink the future. Of our practice, well, of our future practices and our past histories. So, uh, thank you for being the um, ever elusive other architect. So, the screen is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Solomon. It's 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 wonderful to join you uh, this morning, um, afternoon for you, um, and uh, it's it's great to just be a part of your conversations, which I always uh, enjoy and admire at the Berlaga. Um, so this, this, you know, session is, is, you know, charged with addressing ecology. And as Solomon pointed out, we'll do that through uh, construction ecology, um, which I'll discuss briefly. Um, but we'll spend most of the time uh, speaking about the Seagram building. Um, but I think it's, it's worthwhile at the beginning to, to spend a little bit of time um, talking about why we would even engage ecology beyond the obvious, maybe beyond a climate imperative or other you know, seemingly obvious uh, parts of, of our realities and our future. Um, for me, one of the kind of major intellectual um, reasons to think about ecology is that it's one of our best pedagogies um, for thinking about systems rather than objects. Um, so in many ways, um, this project on the Seagram building and, the, and this larger uh, four book series I'm doing on iconic buildings in New York City and, and where they came from um, is in some ways a, a question or a critique uh, about our, even you know, our tradition of, of describing architecture through uh, various forms of Cartesian description, uh, whether that's XYZ coordinates or a kind of um, parallel practice of, of perspective um, drawing that that we've we've been locked as a discipline into these modes of description for hundreds of years, and to some degree that's our expertise. And and most architects wouldn't even you know uh, question the assumption of that basis of what we do. Um, but uh, in all of those cases, in all of those practices, we are always and only describing objects. Um, and we really have no way uh, to describe with those, using those tools, um, all of the kind of political environmental relationships of buildings as objects and where they come from, who builds them, et cetera. That all of that critical content that I think is, is uh, essential to you know, future practices 
um, cannot be described through those means. So you have to draw like sort of cartoons of those objects being built or something like that. Um, so at the very core of this project of mine on ecology and construction ecology is a much broader, you know, a kind of much more fundamental um, question and project about, you know, what architects do, what, you know, methods we use uh, to describe our practices. Um, so, you know, as you know, the history of linear perspective goes, you know, way back. Um, this is a, a top right there, a, uh, an illustration of Alberti's uh, method of describing uh, or, you know, defining uh, perspective in, in Florence. Um, and I've always enjoyed this, this drawing because um, Alberti was very clear about leaving out um, things like clouds, which couldn't be um, defined by the lineaments that he was interested in, the kind of edges of the buildings, the edges of the doors, um, the roof, et cetera, um, that, that, that was always a kind of mystery and he kind of set it aside. Um, and I think it's such an apt image of, a, of our larger history of architecture that um, through our absolute unquestioned loyalty to this perspective and orthographic project um, in architecture, we have most literally set aside the clouds, the climate, the atmosphere. And that is quite literally one reason we have uh, things like climate change or our contributions to climate change. Um, and inversely, um, starting to think about those clouds and the difficulty of their, you know, um, amorphic, nonlinear uh, basis is really important actually to be thinking through. Um, and that's why one might pick up ecology is to think through these other types of relationships that aren't about objects. Um, so all of that's in a, a longer essay um, that I, that I described and titled as uh, a project on nonlinear perspective, that that's what ecology and construction ecology about, is about in architecture, is, is thinking through, um, you know, there's still relationships, there's still lines drawn between things, uh, but they're not no longer just limited to just drawing those objects and they have their own vanishing points, but they're temporal and spatial and, and other things. So um, all of this is just to say that there is a kind of larger more fundamental project on um, thinking about architecture th through uh, ecology and what ecology can teach us as architects beyond uh, the obvious, um, some of the obvious material energetic issues that go along with it. Um, so the method in, in my research is to combine um, systems ecology. I use Howard T. Odom's method that's uh, uh, organized around the term emergy. Um, and it's a, it's a very detailed method for keeping track of how basically solar energy hits the planet and then how that energy moves through the atmosphere, into trees, into rivers, you know, eventually into buildings, into people, into information, et cetera. And how all, that, all those systems converge from very low quality but very highly abundant forms of energy into increasingly concentrated, you know, higher quality objects and processes like, like buildings. Um, and then very importantly, how they also feed back into the system that created it. Um, and it's this you know, aspect of feedback that I think is incredibly important. Modernity has definitely trained us to forget about feedback. Um, and that's how we'll make actually ecological buildings uh, through the, the design of those feedbacks. Um, to some degree, that's a separate lecture by itself. But this is just to say that um, the method involves, you know, uh, in this case, modeling every single aspect of a building, tracing where it came from, um, all architecture's geology before anything else. So we go all the way back to the kind of geological basis of, of any of the materials um, and trace them through um, their, their world ecology um, into the building and, and usually into their future as well. So it's just a, a very, you know, um, highly specific method for doing this. Um, it's much more detailed than these kind of cartoons of life cycle analysis and circular economies and things like that. So it, it offers us some things that are outside um, some of the, you know, kind of normative practices that might, we might associate with the ecology. Um, as Solomon mentioned, there's a kind of second 
kind of layer of analysis that occurs. Like once you have that world map of, of all these material energy flows over space and over time, um, then you have a map of all of the relations that produced a building. So those relations can then be submitted to various forms of analysis. And I just, you know, kind of parenthetically include Wallerstein's system of world uh, analysis, um, which is, you know, a way of, of looking at the social, political, economic relationship of those relations. Uh, so in a very similar way, tracing who touches things, who regulates things, who's buying what, um, what's the flow of that capital, uh, et cetera. So once you have that physical map, then you have a kind of social and um, political map of, of the world. Um, uh, so this, the, I've finished the two uh, first books in this series. So Empire State and Building um, starts with the kind of Anglo settlement of uh, European settlement of, of Manhattan Island um, and traces it all the way through the construction of the Empire State Building. Uh, and then basically I'm doing a, 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 one of these projects every 25 years to track the evolution of the construction ecology of Manhattan through these emblematic, iconic buildings. So the next one, 25 years later, roughly, is the Seagram building. Uh, the, 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 the next one on the deck is, the, is Trump Tower, um, which will describe the sort of neoliberal transformation uh, of, of the building industry. And then something in the early 2000s, uh, there'll be one of the, the you know, so-called sustainable skyscrapers, um, you know, lead and all of that, and um, you know, kind of show the all the falsehoods that are associated with that from an ecological perspective. Uh, but anyway, that's the kind of larger project is to to look at these construction ecology and world systems um, through the case of one city through these buildings. Uh, but today we'll talk about the Seagram Building. Um, which is in this book uh, entitled Unless. Um, and Unless is um, a play, of course, on less is more. Um, but for me, I love the word unless because it's, it's one of our most contingent language words in the English language that something won't happen unless something else happens. Um, we will not have a building. We will not have the Seagram building unless a lot of other terrestrial things happen on this planet and architects uh, are, seem to be kind of uh, quite disinterested often uh, in those other things uh, in service of their kind of abstraction and their fetishization of the object, the building as an object. Um, and the Seagram building is a kind of ideal um, uh, subject uh, for this inquiry because it's, it is one of the most modern of modern buildings. It's, you know, it's kind of one of the most celebrated buildings in terms of it's abstract, abstraction and apparent minimalism. Um, and so the, the kind of you know, thing to do with the most abstract building is to treat it in an incredibly literal way and, and just describe what it is and, and um, where it came from. And so when you submit uh, the Seagram building to uh, the energy analysis, um, you get a kind of ranking or a hierarchy of, of you know, different basically res earthly resources that went into uh, these different material systems that are in the Seagram building. Uh, again, very quickly mapping out where they came from. And, um, you know, the early raw form of the da data is, 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 you know, images like this, where um, we can see that, you know, by weight um, and by mass, by bulk mass, the Seagram building is a concrete building. Um, we never think about the Seagram building as a concrete building, but that's certainly what it is from a kind of physical uh, perspective. Uh, we might describe it as a steel building. Um, that's still fairly significant uh, in terms of the kind of overall weight and, and resources that went into the building. Um, there might be a more discussion about some of the stones, like the travertine, which is, is incredibly negligible in terms of weight and material uh, re world resources. Uh, same with the marbles. Um, one of the most interesting is the brass envelope, which is less than 2% of the building's weight, but almost half of the building's energy. Um, and um, it's fascinating for all kinds of reasons. Um, one of the most important, I think, is that the building is always described as a bronze building, but it's not a bronze building, it's a brass building. Uh, and a brass building, you know, brass as a material has a very different sort of 
geological and terrestrial basis um, than than brass. So um, it's important to follow that through and, you know, in the kind of um, archival work, and there's a whole set of photographs that have never been published about the production of the Seagram building from a, a time life photographer who went to where the brass was being produced, where the glass was being produced, et cetera. Um, so these are some of his photographs. Um, and here's you know, one of my favorite photos in the book, which is uh, these gentlemen staining the brass to look like bronze. Um, and this this project of you know changing the color of, of the brass is is an annual one. So every square inch of this brass envelope is is hand rubbed, oiled every single year um, to make you know to maintain this this bronze appearance. Um, but you know beyond the kind of maybe discursive or um, kind of historical aspects of how our architectural historians have discussed uh, the appearance of the Seagram building. Uh, if we look at the physical um, data, again, it gets kind of interesting. So here's the mass. And again, we see that concrete is the most significant, but in terms of energy, the, the bronze, the brass is the most significant. And it's this disjunction between the kind of energy required, the world resources uh, required to produce that material relative to its weight that's really significant. So that tells me that there's a lot of world system stories to uncover and tell uh, about this material. Um, why does it cost so much uh, relative to its weight, weight et cetera? Um, and so in, to get more specific about the world systems analysis, um, I use various modes of unequal ecological exchange, unequal economic exchange, environmental load displacement uh, methods, and, um, and Stephen Bunker's theory of underdevelopment, which is basically looking at how um, in extractive periphery zones um, are, are structurally underdeveloped over time through these processes of, of extraction and unequal exchange that they get, uh, you know, poorer and poorer over time. They do not lack, they do not have the means to either rehabilitate their environment, the mines, the jungle, whatever it might be. Um, and the wealth gets concentrated in, you know, the, the kind of concentrating urban agglomerations, this case, Midtown Manhattan. Um, so that, you know, we have underdevelopment in one part of the world and overdevelopment in, in another. And that's a really important uh, relationship uh, that has, you know, lots of uh, social, economic and political content uh, attached to it. Um, so just to get started on, on some of these material stories, I'll go through a couple of them this morning. Um, the, the brass is maybe one of the most interesting. Um, and so brass in the mid-century was um, you know, largely produced in Western United States and Montana and Arizona. Uh, but by far the most um, brass that was being mined, the copper that was being mined for the brass uh, came from Chile. Uh, and the, the, the mines in Chile are in the Andes Mountains. Um, they're there because the, the, the two plates that are sliding by each other um, create a lot of friction as they're, they're one's descending and one's rising. Um, and that uh, friction creates an incredible amount of heat, which liquefies some of the metallic elements, including the copper, which leach up um, through buoyancy and cool in the joints and cracks of the continental crust of the Andes Mountains and create what are known as porphyry uh, deposits. And that's what people mine, right? So that's the sort of geological basis of the copper that's in the Seagram building. Um, if uh, we look at the Andes, this is the, you know, the driest place on the planet. Uh, it's quite high in elevation. Um, hasn't seen rain in you know several years in the Atacama Desert. Um, this is the where this this copper came from, the Chico Camada mine. It's the uh, largest hole that humans have ever dug. It's several miles wide and deep. Um, it's a, a really intense in construction. Some of these smallest little dots that you can see on these roads are the largest uh, vehicles that humans have made. Um, so the kind of scale of this is, is hard to sort of fathom. Um, 
But when we look at the, the mine itself over time, we can see there's a town on the lower left. We can see the factory in the kind of center bottom. But most of what we see is the hole and then lots of uh, tailings, different ways that they've been dumping. Um, you know, if you get two, three, four percent of, of copper ore out of uh, some, you know, some bucket of extraction out of the, the mine, uh, you end up with a lot of, you know, 95% of it is going back just as tailings that need to be dumped. And um, so we see all these different methods they have for dumping these tailings. Um, and um, as this piled up through the 20th century, um, in the early 21st century, they had to make a decision about, uh, is it easier or cheaper to move people move the town or is it cheaper to move the, the tailings? And they decided that it's easier to move the, the town. Um, so here uh, in this aerial image, you can see that the, the piles of tailings are starting to overtake this town. Um, so these enormous uh, new mountains that are being made um, are literally crushing the houses of the miners that you know pulled that ore out of the ground, right? And this is, uh, in, you know, again, highly emblematic image of, of what's going on in this unequal exchange um, and a very clear picture of kind of labor relations. Um, this is a town where Che uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time living with a family, uh, a miner's family, uh, and he was, you know, you know struck and, and, and motivated, highly motivated by uh, the labor conditions here and that that was a significant part of the motorcycle diaries. Um, so this is just to say that there's this just kind of captures some of the kind of social, economic, and labor relations that are attached in this case to the copper. Um, you know, the Chiku Kamado was one place where uh, that copper came from. Um, the Anaconda mine in, in Butte, Montana is another place. Um, the, the, the mine in Butte, Montana uh, is now the largest Superfund state, uh, site in the United States. Um, it's been dumping basically toxic uh, dust on the region around the mine for, for decades. Um, and there's no really clear way to you know, so-called so clean it up, right? So it's, it's forms of underdevelopment, um, giving people in that region cancer, et cetera. Is, is not just at the kind of moment of extraction, but goes on for decades and decades afterwards. Uh, but if we follow that flow of, of the copper, um, a lot of it's gonna arrive um, in Chicago um, and Ohio, where, uh, where the, the, the copper was mixed uh, with the other elements to pr produce the brass. Um, and here we see one of the Seagram building brass um, ingots uh, being heated up, um, and that's going to start the process. Uh, this ingot will become one of the uh, brass mullions on the facade of the Seagram building. Um, so that ingot gets pushed through a whole set of dyes, um, custom-made dyes that were the kind of largest uh, mullions that could be produced with the machinery in North America at the time. And um, you know, this is a classic thing for an architect to do. They want the biggest piece of glass, the, you know, the biggest mullion they can get, et cetera. Um, but all this was highly, uh, uh, you know, customized uh, for the Seagram building. Um, here we see one of the gentlemen, uh, you know, pushing, there's, you push and pull uh, on an extrusion process like this. So they're uh, shaping the, the brass mullion into that mullion, final mullion shape. Uh, so here's this very large pneumatic hammer that's ramming uh, the brass through. Uh, incredibly loud process. You can see here like no hearing protection, et cetera, things that you might expect today in a factory setting. Um, but again, it's just another example of some of the unequal exchanges between you know, this person working and, and maybe a CEO or, or Mies himself working on the Seagram building. Um, when you know you produce brass uh, mullions like this, you know out of these out of these dyes, um, they're anything but straight. Um, you know one of the kind of common tropes of the Seagram building that we have from architectural historians is that it's a a machine industrial produced building. Uh, but when you look at the actual production processes, it's it's highly handcrafted. Uh, it's an arts and crafts building in my mind because every one of those brass mullions had to be hand straightened. Uh, so this, this Polish guy here um, is, has his jig there and he's hand tapping every one of the, the brass mullions uh, to straighten them out um, and produce 
what looks like an industrialized uh, product. Um, and so again, there's this uh, kind of, in my mind, a disjunction between how the building's described and how it, it was actually produced. Once those mullions are, are straightened out, uh, they go into a chemical bath um, to, to clean all of the, the mill oils off of it um, and to prepare it for shipping. Um, and again, super toxic chemical bath here, no protection anywhere to be seen on the, on the laborers. Uh, but once those uh, mullions are dipped and dried, they're stacked up, um, which I think is one of the most beautiful photographs um, of the Seagram building uh, is this pile of uh, brass mullions. Those brass mullions will be shipped to, packaged and shipped to uh, Long Island, where they'll be combined with um, brass components from several other factories um, in, in Ohio and in New Bedford, Massachusetts, that were making some of the smaller elements and the mullion, uh, the spandrel panels uh, for the brass envelope. So when they get uh, when they arrive to Long Island, they're unpackaged. They're they're cleaned once again to remove any dust and dirt, um, because the next stage in the process is the the staining uh, of that brass to look like bronze. The facade panels are assembled uh, in Long Island, um, glued together, sealed up, um, welded, and uh, and then of course installed in the building itself. Um, and um, it's important to know that the, you know, all of this is building, um, the geology, the, the extraction, the production, the assembly, all of that is part of the building process uh, as a terrestrial activity. And it's important to understand that building continues after the, 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 the building itself is built. And so in, the, in this case, again, it's the acts of maintenance that occur long after the construction of the building uh, to maintain this particular appearance that was desired and is the kind of um, now our, 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 you know, our expected image of the Seagram building. Um, another uh, material that's, uh, I think, full of interesting stories um, is, is the glass. Um, the, you know, it's like alongside the brass and bronze envelope of the Seagram building, the glass is maybe the, the most second most iconic uh, material in the building. Um, you know, this kind of amber hue of this glass was, was very important. There's often allusions made to the, the liquors that the Seagram Corporation uh, produces and paid for this building, which was the most expensive building ever built uh, at the time uh, in the mid fifties. Um, and, you know, the, this glass is not typical glass. It was highly customized. I mean, we spent a lot of time on the specification and chemistry of the glass to produce this, this amber like appearance. Um, and um, importantly, it could not be pr produced with normal uh, mid-century glass production uh, processes. So it was actually using an almost medieval process that I'll describe. Um, it's a single pane uh, of glass. Um, so uh, you know, the, there's this energy star system in the United States that ranks buildings, their kind of so-called energy, basically their fuel uh, performance, their fuel efficiency, on a scale of zero to 100. And most buildings are in the 80s, 90s, uh, even some of Trump's towers are in the 90s. Um, the Seagram building have, has a score of three on that scale uh, because it's just, uh, it's, there's, there's only a couple place, uh, pieces of insulation that you can find in this building. It's just the solid you know, brass envelope and a single pane of glass. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a material hog and a, and a fuel hog. Um, but, um, but that's all because of the, again, the specification of the glass and you couldn't make an insulated glazing unit out of this type of glass. Um, so that, that glass uh, was all produced at a, um, a factory in Western Pennsylvania, you know, hours away from uh, New York City. Um, and it begins um, with this, it's known as the kind of pot method of glass production. So all of the glass uh, elements are heated up and liquefied and, and put into these uh, large vats uh, that are heated up in these kilns. And um, 
and then there that that material that glass material is poured uh, from this vat onto these cast iron tables down this uh, slide and the uh, cast iron table as you can see is on tracks and moves very slowly and draws the glass out um, into more or less a, a, a you know kind of uniform thickness um, and uh, this is it's it's amber colored in this photo because it's um, it is it's it's hot but it's also is the amber color of the glass in the end. Um, so they pull uh, the the glass out, making the sheets uh, of the Seagram building glass, and they can cut it in its liquid stage. And they pull these uh, cast iron tables off and let them cool. Um, and, and then they have to go through a whole process of, of polishing and grinding um, each face uh, of these glass sheets. So this is very material intensive, very labor intensive, very slow process. Um, it all occurred um, at the standard plate glass uh, factory in, in Butler, Pennsylvania. So these are some of the um, uh, fire insurance maps of Butler, Pennsylvania that always uh, include kind of basic architectural plans, um, some of the material systems that were in these buildings. So they're great for kind of doing some uh, kind of uh, historical work on, on how, how the glass was produced and how it moved through this factory uh, in this case. So in this hall that's highlighted, um, this is where the material's heated up. And then as it's uh, drawn out um, and it's put into these uh, grinding halls um, and polishing halls, which consisted of these very large circular uh, discs and tables. Um, and they would you know, put the sheet of glass and, and you know, embed it in plaster of Paris uh, and let it harden. And then uh, basically they start spinning the top and spinning the bottom and they put in increasingly fine types of sand uh, to, to do the grinding and the polishing. Um, so once that glass has been polished and, and, and grinded down to the specified thickness, um, it's then packaged up uh, into, into wood and sawdust containers and loaded onto a train uh, headed for New York City. Um, and uh, given the kind of unique, again, you know, handcrafted basis uh, of this, uh, the glass for the Seagram building. Um, only this firm, only this factory was willing to take on that project. Everybody else rejected um, <laughs> any, any bid on, on the Seagram building contract. Um, and that came at great cost uh, to the standard plate glass factory because um, while they were producing this glass, Pilkington developed a new um, method for producing architectural glass, which is now the world standard, the float, you know, float process for producing flat glass. Um, and all of the other factories in Western Pennsylvania, which are all there because there's lots of cheap natural gas and cheap labor for the factories, um, they all switched uh, their factories uh, to the float glass um, method. Um, while the, the, this company, while this factory was producing the, the Seagram building glass. And by the time they were done with the, the job, uh, they were effectively, um, uh, they couldn't get any new work because they were more, way more expensive because they hadn't you know, altered their physical capital of their factory. Um, and they went out of business um, about a year or so after the Seagram building job, they just couldn't compete economically uh, with uh, the other factories. Um, and at this stage um, in Butler's history, it was the only factory um, in, in Butler, Pennsylvania. And so the closure of this factory led to the Rust Belt depression uh, of this town, uh, which it, it is still in today. Um, and so there's a you know, very direct link between the specification of this glass and the whole economic history of this town in the second half of the 20th century. Um, uh, when you put this Sanborn map onto an aerial uh, of, of Butler, Pennsylvania, you can see where the factory sat um, relative to some of the streets and other you know, workers' housing, et cetera. Um, by the 80s, 1980s, uh, this factory was a brownfield site. It, the, the factory caught fire and was a, you know, it was a, a sore spot for many people in town. 
um, to look at, uh, to see the kind of literal depression of the town manifested in the ruin of this factory. Uh, so a mayor in the 1980s uh, converted this factory site, ruined site into a park um, and located uh, low-income housing, senior housing, and introduced it, you know, playgrounds and, and ball fields on the site of this factory. Um, in to start to kind of change the image of the town. Uh, and that's all well and good, um, but there's some problems with that that we'll see in a minute. So here we see Butler, Pennsylvania, the, the, the site of the, the factory there. Um, and basically all the material from the factory just created a, a kind of new earth construction there, which is uh, the, the area of, of fill there um, from that hill. Um, and um, the, the problem with this kind of uh, uh, transformation of this site um, is that in some ways the most vulnerable populations in this town, the you know, kind of low income residents, seniors and children are the ones that now have access to the site, which is still leaching arsenic and other chemicals related to the glass production. And so it is, it's, it's not a super fun site, not a national super fun site, but it is a, a state um, environmental uh, site uh, that they monitor and, and, and you know, keep track of how much arsenic is going into to the people around this, this park. Um, so again, we have the kind of underdevelopment of, of this you know, extractive zone, which is in this case, productive zone, the Western Pennsylvania. You know, again, it doesn't uh, often, I think when architects talk about extraction, it's, it's always these far flung places. It's the global North versus the global South, et cetera. Um, but a lot of these underdevelopment processes, these unequal exchange processes can occur you know, within hours of a building site or on a building site. Um, so it's good to kind of, again, keep that literal map of where everything comes from, because there's a, a lot of stories to tell. There's a lot of architecture to understand, uh, even within hours of, of this case of the Seagram building. Um, so um, there you have it. You have the, you know, the Seagram building, the kind of icon, the object uh, that we're familiar with. This is the, you know, kind of classic Ezra Stoller photograph of the building. Um, you know, we even think of it as this kind of extruded, you know, single mass, but there's a lot of Seagram building that, that's behind that building uh, and this kind of awkward backpack, uh, hip pack of the building. Um, but nonetheless, we have this, this building, which um, uh, is described as a trophy. It's in, in real estate uh, jargon, it's, it's a trophy building, which is the kind of highest end of, of type A office space. Uh, it, it, it garners the most highest rent, uh, some of the highest rent in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, that's again, just because of, of its status. Um, but I also see it as a trophy uh, in the kind of ancient Roman sense that, um, you know, that uh, a trophy is, is what you bring back uh, after a a victory in the field that you'll bring back the treasures, the people, uh, materials of the place that you just conquered. Um, and the Seagram building is very much a trophy, you know, kind of uh, the victory of all the world system exchanges that produced it, uh, that all that wealth is concentrated in this, on this site um, at the expense of these other places that, that produced this building. Um, so it's also trophic in the eco ecological sense that the, you know, basically any ecology is organized into a hierarchy of, of trophic levels of that, that feed on each other. Um, and it's very clear to see how that works uh, in the case of this building. So we have a trophy building in midtown Manhattan and we have atrophy occurring elsewhere in, in the world system uh, of, the, of, of, that, of that building process. Right. Um, so when we start to look at it, the Seagram building no longer as an object, but as a set of processes and, and systems uh, and relations, um, then we start to develop a more nonlinear description of what this architecture actually is. Um, and it's in many ways, it's as simple as just uh, kind of exploding uh, what that object is, uh, mapping out where everything came from, and, and, and being able to describe those relations to each other. Um, so it's in, in, in some just a, a different way to describe what architecture is and does on the thin surface uh, of this planet. Um, and uh, maybe just as a kind of closing slide, um, I usually end with, um, you know, if, if one of 
Mises aphorisms was that God is in the details. He was a very secular guy. Um, I don't know why he was invoking a kind of non-secular description of his details, but that's part of his, his mythology and in, in the discourse. Um, but if, so if God's not in the details, I, I do think uh, Gaia is in the details of those details, right? In the kind of deeper, broader uh, systems, terrestrial systems that, that go into what we think of as, as the details of a building, but which really, especially in the case of the Seagram building, often mask and abstract a lot of the actual uh, world system details of, of architecture. So I, th I think I'll leave it there, Salman, and, and, and open it up for some discussion, if, if that's all right. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, maybe you can stop screen sharing. Okay. Uh, so you can see us. Yes. Questions, guys? I have a question actually as we have, well, I mean, yeah, I was wondering, is there any way, do you imagine any way, any sort of remediation, for instance, for tailing, you know, of, uh, where does minerals come from? I mean, do you see a sort of reverse engineering? Do you think there are any ways of doing it? How do you envision this process to happen? Can we invert this tendency? Yeah, I, I, I understand the kind of impetus of your question, um, but I wanna, my response would be, let's not treat it as damage and then remediating that or something like that, right? So just to give you a couple examples, like as an architect, I do a lot of timber buildings because I live in the northeast of the United States. And so um, I'm, you know, my, my decades long project is to figure out how to do, let's say, a good timber building that improves the health of the forest, that improves the diversity of the forest, that doesn't just wreck it or something like that, right? So, um, which is different than wrecking the forest and then trying to remediate it or regenerate it or something like that. So it's actually how can we use a process of building um, to actually make those other systems more robust, to, to work with the loggers in a certain way, to pay them in a certain wage and that sort of thing. To work out all of those relationships is just as important as my window detail or my structural system or whatever, right? Um, so I would like to think as an architect, I'm designing all of those relationships. Uh, another quick example, uh, just to, you know, the timber one is, is a little bit easier uh, to achieve and that's why I'm working on it. Uh, but as a kind of stone example, uh, one of my favorite European architects, uh, Gilles Perdon in southern France, who does um, massive stone buildings um, using the quarry that produced the Pont du Gard uh, Roman aqueduct um, near Nice, um, is working with the quarry um, in such a way that as he extracts stones for the buildings, that they're producing a park for the town, right? And what I like about that example is that again, it's not, it is an extractive process, but it's producing something through that, right? It's not, the quarry isn't just a kind of underdevelopment zone. It's, it's actually adding something uh, to the town um, that could, could otherwise just be an industrial waste site, right? So um, those are just a couple quick examples, but I, I think it's very important for me as an architect to say that those are, um, I think architectural ways to address this and not just like some retro um, kind of fix uh, for the ruined site or something like that, right? So the architecture of the building extends to the forest, extends to the quarry and those two examples, right? Um, so that's, I would say those are kind of more productive, uh, projective ways of thinking about the problem rather than a kind of, uh, you know, retrospective, you know, repair or something of, of, of our damage that we've done. Um, and that's, you know, it's deeply embedded, um, I find, in how architects, they just assume that we're going to do damage and then we have to kind of, you know, uh, do better after the fact or something like that. But I, I think there is, truly is a way to, you know, sort of do, you know, something productive for the building and productive for these, these landscapes and these people um, at the same time, right? They're, they're not mutually exclusive, um, but we often are, are trained to think that we, um, 
the best we could do is less bad or something like that. And it's, it's, uh, it's I think it's the wrong mindset. Um, so yeah, that's great. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, so I was wondering, um, how do you think that the practice of tracing back uh, the materials can uh, influence the way that the suppliers of the materials, um, like the chain works? Yeah, um, and first, you know, I'm always uh, somewhat of a stickler, especially in the kind of world of ecology uh, for vocabulary. Um, so a lot of people refer to that, what you described as the, as the supply chain. Um, and I, that's already kind of uh, placing the prime value on the, uh, like on the building as the object that things are supplying that. Um, so it's a, um, a receiver theory base, a, a receiver theory of value. Uh, versus uh, what it what we need, which is the ecological perspective, which is a donor theory of value. So, what's the value that these things offer? You know, the building, et cetera. It's a, just to, it inverts the uh, how we theorize and calculate value uh, in these systems. But um, so, how does it change things? Um, I mean, it changes a lot for the architect because suddenly, just the world's just not a kind of infinite reserve of matter and energy that you can just draw on, right? Like, there's some uh, very specific uh, value chains that you would uh, track and develop and design uh, over time. So it has a pretty, in some ways, some are, you know, some people think it seems very limiting uh, compared to the previous kind of modernists where everything's just available to you. Um, but I, I think once you get into those relationship, there's so much to design, so much to understand that I don't find it limiting at all. Like I, I appreciate those limits and I can really focus on a certain piece of stone or a certain type of wood and, and what all those processes are. Um, and it's it's not easy to do, but um, so and that's what it changes for the architect. Uh, were you asking more about what, what it is for the, the people and places uh, where these materials come from? Or could you tell me a little bit more about your question? Um, yeah, I'm thinking that um, obviously if the architects start making the change, uh, it will impact the, the industry that is, again, providing the, the materials. So, but then my question is, how, how, do, how do you think that the change is going to happen? If, if, how can the class of architects um, make impactful change uh, in the way that the suppliers uh, produce the, the materials, so the extractions okay. and... Yeah. So um, let's say there's the case of the individual architect doing a single building and trying to have some impact or whatever. And I think that's good, important work to be doing. Um, but the real issue is the whole, how the whole building industry is set up and, and what, what what those systems are at a much different scale, right? So um, I'd say just what, I'm just gonna give you an example of one of my students from the GSD who went through these types of seminars and, and work uh, with me and, and some of my colleagues at the GSD. Um, she was a very talented designer, got a, you know, a post-professional design degree from Harvard and a research degree with us. Um, and could clearly go work for anybody, you know, any kind of you know, fancy boutique architect that she would want to. Uh, but she decided to graduate and go work for AECOM in Los Angeles, which is, you know, one of the largest architecture and engineering firms in the world. And she went there to become a spec writer, um, which we usually think of as the most boring part of the architecture office, right? Um, and not only a spec writer, but a spec writer for sand, for all the concrete projects that um, AECOM is doing around the Pacific Rim. And sand is you know, one of the most fraught materials, it seems very basic, but, um, you know, certainly uh, what, what's happening in China with sand, it's, you know, um, what's going on, like uh, even, you know, where she was working in Los Angeles, sand for all the concrete projects in LA does not come from the desert around LA. It comes from Vancouver um, in Canada because it's a certain type of sand, it's clean, et cetera. Um, 
So just by working on sand uh, for a few years, she will have more environmental political impact than all of us put together, right? So um, there's, in terms of impact, let's just say she designed a, a completely different type of architecture practice uh, to think about these issues and to act on them at the scale at which they matter, right? And I think that that's, that's a, one of the kind of big, you know, cognitive leaps that, that I'd say next generation of designers could make if they want to is to re-describe what architects do right now we often constrain ourselves to think that we're working on a, a one building at a time or maybe some urban agglomeration at a time or something like that and that's a jump in scale it's really not what she did i think was a really significant jump in scale right like all of the, the all of the sand and all the concrete specifications for all of that part of the world is is like it's it's huge um so getting that slightly better has a, you know, an enormous impact, right? So um, again, that's kind of like the impact it has on, on, on the architect and, and what one might do with their career based on this. Um, but that's how you start to achieve those relationships. And that's how you start to make some of those handshakes um, in the building industry that, you know, where you can have some impact on whether, whether it's sand or stone or timber or whatever, um, but those, those relationships are super important. You can't just sit at your, you know, fancy architecture office in New York City and expect this stuff to happen. You can't do it in Rhino. You know, you, like there's other, other places and other practices that you have to adopt uh, to be able to do this work. So it does fundamentally change the labor of what, what the architect does and who they are in society, uh, which I'm, I'm all for. <laughs> It makes completely sense. Thank you. Thank you. T touching upon how you mentioned how one of your former students, she uh, she sort of developed her own uh, architectural practice with regards to her work, writing specs for sand and so on and so forth. Um, well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your overall project uh, trying to get us more aware about these different interconnected world systems and uh, things like that. Um, you know, if I sit here and I'm holding this cup in this uh, paper cup, right, which has like wax in it, there's all these other connections too, just in this one thing. And there's so many things like this in life where it'd be nice if we were more aware about the different connections, the different things which led to the development of this cup and working backwards from it the same way you did it with the secret building. Um, and of course, it's very difficult to make, to always be aware of those things, right? There's so many things to be aware of. So this is less of a, less of a question and more about your thoughts on uh, the idea of a new architectural service where there are some highly specialized individuals such as yourself, I think. I, I think you're kind of doing that by talking about uh, these interconnected systems. An individual or group of individuals who goes around um, Maybe they're consultants to other firms and they do the investigative work of, of, uh, of tracing things down like underdevelopment and uh, uh, economic or uh, imbalance of an economic exchange. Yeah, so, um, you know, certainly I, I wouldn't mind if uh, many of you went out and started some consultancy and did this sort of work. Um, I, think, I think there's a place for that in architecture. Um, but as an architect, um, I, I want you, I, I want you to change your habit of mind uh, about this fundamentally. I don't want this to become a, something that you farm out to somebody else, that there's some expert on it. Uh, for me, this is, uh, if you go back and read Vitruvius or any of the treatises on architecture, um, you know, they spend a third of the book talking about the province of materials, climate, all these different things that are part of the definition of an architect. Um, and that you can't really practice without knowing that stuff. And I, I, I'm very sympathetic to that description of what architecture is. Um, so I see this as a, a, a kind of deeply architectural project, not one that's like an adjacent, you know, expertise, like an engine, structural engineer or something like that. Like this is all we actually do is specify and configure uh, these materials. Um, you know, as a modernist, as objects, but, you know, Vitruvius or, um, you know, Pladio or others, you know, would see this as, um, Scamazzi would see this as, um, you know, 
core to what architecture is as a discipline and what our, our, our what our knowledge should be. Um, so, but again, modernity has trained us to forget all that and, and to focus on the object and fetishize the object. And if we're, we're really good at that. Um, so good at it that I think we can, we, by this time we can, you know, kind of re expand our system boundary and, and description of what architecture is and, and take on some of these other, uh, obligations and opportunities that are attached to this. Um, so just, I, I'm glad that you picked up your cup. Um, you know, I, uh, one seminar I run is on the energetics of urbanization. And, and what we do is just examine what seem like very simple objects like your cup, or one of my favorite examples that I, I lecture on is the uh, Fiji water bottle, which is just this insane world system. Like just, it's astonishing uh, what goes into that, what, what stories are attached to that. And it does take us a whole semester to kind of go through the method and unpack things and do the research about where everything's coming from and, and do the kind of systems ecology analysis of that and the world systems analysis of it. But why I do that is that it is, it develops a habit of mind and you can't, you know, you can't go to a train station anymore and, and pick up a Fiji water bottle, you know, uh, like it's just, it's impossible. And if, if architects could develop that, those habits of mind about, um, what these systems are and, and start to peer into things a bit, you develop some intuitions about it, right? Like what, what, what's really going to matter. And, and it, certainly the bulk material of the structure, which is almost always the heaviest part of the building, most massive part of the building, that's always going to be of significance. Right. And so you start to develop some assumptions and, 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 you know, starting points uh, about what you might, you know, start to consider. Um, so, um, but again, that's still in a kind of category of maybe doing less bad, potentially. Um, I like the kind of uh, trajectory of the first question about thinking about how maybe we could actually be doing some good, right? So inverting that, of, of figuring out how bad the wax cup is and figuring out what the good cup would be is a much more interesting architectural project, right? Um, but it involves the same methods, right? And that's the conundrum of, of using, you know, historical buildings, um, as a way to present this material um, is that everybody sees it as a kind of historical form of analysis. But for me, it's my way as an architect of thinking, developing a, a more projective speculative method of design, uh, you know, using all the same frameworks. Um, it's just that the, you know, the, an iconic building like the Seagram building just makes it super accessible and discursive for everybody, right? And a uh, historian who might never look at a ecology book we'll look at the Seagram building book, right? And so for me, it's just a kind of a, a way of, of communicating and, and having these types of conversations, uh, of, you know, about what architecture is. So, um, but yeah, I think it's important to keep, keep the, develop a habit of mind for the kind of speculative dimension of this, the projective dimension of it. I think that's a very nice way to end. Thank you for reminding us what the architect is instead of the architect as. I mean, it's interesting that you talk about that in terms of, let's say, the modern project, but I mean, I would also add that maybe this has been a problem for the last 25 or 30 years of multidisciplinarity, right? So I think it's interesting to go back to uh, all the things the architect is and how yeah. her practice um, revolves around uh, Absolutely. a multitude of things. So on that note, uh, we either let you go get another cup of coffee and let you go back and take a nap um, or go to the construction site. So thank you uh, so much for this uh, wonderful lecture and for sharing your inspiring thinking with us. And um, well, I hope there's an opportunity that once all the projects balance that we can have you uh, back here in the Netherlands physically, but only as part of the larger project so we don't uh, tarnish your ecological so um, have a good day. Thank you so much, everybody.